Hey, I'm Brother Taylor Lindeman, pastor at First Baptist Church in Brooklyn, Mississippi. We're so glad you joined us online today for this sermon. You can find additional sermons at these online sources. I hope that the sermon today speaks to you, and we pray that God will move through it. And open your Bibles with me this morning to a different book of the Bible than 1 Corinthians. Let's look this morning at Acts chapter 11. I'm putting a pause uh, in between our look at 1 Corinthians before we move on to chapter 10 on next week. I want to look this morning at Acts chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 and also verse 18. Three years ago, on the first Sunday in August, I became the new pastor at First Baptist Church Brooklyn after a vote the previous week. And my very first sermon that I preached was uh, Growth Strategies for First Baptist Church Brooklyn. Uh, at the time, we were a church that desired to grow. Um, we were in transition. Um, it would be at the end of August that we would have only myself on staff, and we would go through the growing pains of finding a new staff. Then the Lord would throw COVID in the mix and all the other problems that came our way. But in that very first sermon, uh, I looked back at my notes in preparation for this one because we looked actually in the book of Acts, and we looked in Acts chapter 2 at the end of Peter's sermon, what happened in that growing church of the first century. And I told you as a small congregation at that time where uh, we were in transition, where a lot of things were happening, that if we wanted to grow as a church, we need to do the very things that God did in that congregation in Acts chapter 2. And the very first thing that they did is they trusted in the Holy Spirit. Not in marketing strategies, not in any other types of growth strategies that pastoral ministry and seminaries might provide, but that we would trust in the Holy Spirit. And that would be the thing that would grow a church, not us. And then we looked and we saw that after Pentecost, it tells us that the new believers in the early church, they spent time desirous in the word of God. They committed themselves to preaching, to teaching, to the Lord's Supper, to baptism. They committed themselves to doing what we're doing here. And I challenged you to have a thirst and a hunger for God's word. And I am happy this morning, not to brag because it's not me. Again, it is the Holy Spirit. And it's also not me, but it's the unity of working hands here in this congregation. But parting, part of being desirous for the Word of God is to desire what we're doing right now, gathering together and looking at it. And I'm happy to say that three years later, I can absolutely say we have been desirous for the Word of God because I don't always count. Somebody usually does it for me. But did you know that on Sunday evening, just a few weeks ago, we had almost 70 in this room, which was at the time of August 2019, more than we had in the congregation on Sunday morning. We had that on Sunday nights because we're hungering and thirsting to know more about the Lord, because we want to dive deep into the scriptures. I am happy that we are a church who is still doing three years later what I've called and challenged us to do and what God's word has challenged us to do in that regard. And finally, the last thing I challenged you with three years ago is to have unity across this church, to reach across the aisle, to know one another, to repair broken relationships. And I think it is a sign of all of these things that as I preached three years ago that I want to see, and I know you want to see, and I know the Lord wants to bless us with growth. Now I can say, hallelujah, amen. We're a church that's growing. And it shows in our Sunday school that has more in attendance on the past three Sundays than we have in enrollment for the entire church year. It shows in that these pews are filled up more than ever before. It shows in that all of these visitors who are coming, sometimes I look out and I wonder if there's more visitors out there than our church members. It's a good sign. It's a good sign when people are walking down the aisle, when I have stood there before and Kyle has conducted before and we sang three verses and not a person walked. And it would happen like that for months and months and months. And I remember in 2019, as I was on fire, I remember I asked Debbie to play a strange, strange song at Offertory because we didn't have any, any Kyle to guide us. And, and Debbie, she's, she's, she's for it. I said, Debbie at Offertory. Let's put on a church on fire. And it was this crazy song. It was, it was all up and up and I was excited. 
and the guy and God tampered me, tempered me. He said, you know, all your staff's going to leave. COVID's going to come. And now is the time. Now is the time of growth that God is blessing what we've wanted to happen for so long. But with all of that growth comes something that we didn't foresee. It comes, and this is the title of the sermon this morning, is it's the problems of a growing church. It's as Brother Kyle put it the other day when we were talking about the very problems that we have as a growing church, it's growing pains. And so this morning, I want to kind of, it's an extension of a sermon from three years ago that when I look back, and it's so timely that it's today, the first Sunday of August, three years later, that I look back over what God's done and I say, wow, God has done so much in our church and he's not done yet. And here is the next speed bump. Here's the next hurdle that if we will look back and we trusted in God that he would do what his word says and that he would grow his church by Holy Spirit power, then today we look and we say, okay, Lord, we, we fast forward in Acts just a couple of years into the early church. And Lord, what, what problems did they face? And on the other side of it, how did they continue to grow and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ despite those problems? Let's stand together in the honor of reading God's word as we look at some of the problems in the early church. Acts chapter 11, this morning we're looking at verses 1 through 3 and then verse 18. Hear now the words of the living and true God. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. Verse 18, When they heard these things, they held their peace, and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Let us pray. Father, we come to you a congregation that is so thankful for what you're doing in our lives and in our church and in our broader community. And Lord, we thank you that as your word, we have trusted in it. We see and we have testified even this morning of your goodness over all of us. Lord, I pray that as we, we, we challenge ourselves to continue steadfastly in faithfulness and in following your word, Lord, I pray that all of these challenges that are popping up before us, Lord, that this morning we might see another strategy in which to intervene, to squash the devil, and to continue forward in gospel ministry, not for our glory, not for man's glory, but for your glory. Lord, I pray this morning that as we search your scriptures, that all ears would be attentive, that you'd speak to us, yes, both from my mouth, but mostly from your word. Lord, I pray that you'd be here and active as we meet this morning. And I ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And you may have a seat. I think the first thing as we look at verse one this morning is we've got to praise God for what he's doing. You know, there, there are big problems that we're, we're facing in this church. I don't, I don't know if you've been back to Sunday school lately, um, but we're running out of Sunday school classrooms. Uh, I think there's a bigger problem that every single one of us can notice is every time we come in here and we smell that delicious fried chicken that our chicken missionaries have gone to pick up. Hey, Don, you know what? It's so packed in there. It's so loud. It, it's about getting like, we need another fellowship hall. There's so many people going there to eat that chicken. It, that's a good sign. But hey, there's, there's all these different structural issues we face as we look out over the numbers in our congregation. And it's easy to say, that's a, that's a problem. We need to fix this. These, these are issues. But we need to take a step back in all of this. And I think this is the first thing we do, guys, is we say, praise God that we don't have enough room in our fellowship hall. Praise God it's loud in there. Praise God that when I walk into Sunday school, there is 15 people gathered around a table. I, I went and I took two kids I was doing baptismal counseling with during Sunday school, and we finished early, so I took them to Anthony's class. Anthony had three kids sitting on the floor. They were gentlemen. The boys um, decided they wanted the girls to sit down. And I bring two more in there. I'm like, Lord, they're going to hang them from the seat in here. So we went and we found chairs and we put chairs in Anthony's room because there's so many people in the fourth through sixth grade class that there's not enough room around the table. Hallelujah. That's good. Amen. But it's a problem. But all these problems we first have to look at and we have to say, as we already have, praise 
guide. Let's look at Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Amen and hallelujah. The Gentiles, those people who were outside of God's covenant throughout the Old Testament, those people who were heathen and lived lives that were sinful. And when we look at it in 1 Corinthians, we see many of the problems that they faced and many of the grave sins that they had. And praise God, they have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. This is good stuff. And I wonder in our own church, maybe you have been the negative Nancy who said, whew, I see fans going, it's a little hot in here. That's part of it, y'all. All, all these people, they sucking up the cold air. It's, it's part of it. It's July. I wonder, have we gone in here and said, whew, it's loud in there. That's part of it. God's blessing us. I wonder when we go in the back and we sit in those cramped Sunday school rooms, whew, I just, I don't know if I'm going to come to Sunday school next week. There's just too many people in here. No, praise God. I wonder, have we been negative or have we been praising God in all of these things? Because I remember, as I've already said, a time where I pleaded with God that we would have people walk these aisles. I pleaded with God that we would dust off the spider webs in the baptistry. I pleaded with God that we would have, because there was a time when there was just a handful of people and there wasn't no fellowship lunch. It was just a, a dinner. And I remember one time we had two pieces of fried chicken and some peas in there. Hallelujah, I'm glad we can eat. I'm glad we can gather together in fellowship. I wonder, have we been negative? Or we have we noticed that in all the problems we're facing, it is part of God's blessing. The devil says, look at all the bad. God says, look at all I've blessed you with. Are we noticing the good? Or are we noticing the bad? Because while we praise God in times where things are growing, There's also some problems that come with it. And you might have recognized as we read through that the problem even exists in verse 1. It it, it leads us into it that the church is growing, but it's Gentiles. It's not good. Not in their eyes. Look with me at verses 2 and 3. The problem comes, and when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. God has sent growth to the church, but it's not in the way in which the church would have wanted. In youth group, this is what me and Clay call clicks. I've preached it. He's preached it. Both when we had our own youth, it exists in every single youth group because you've got the older kids and you've got the younger kids. You've got the preppy kids, and you've got the nerdy kids, and you've got the athletes, and you've got the band geeks. You've got all of the ones in between. Yeah, I'm a band geek. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it, Clay. You've got all in between, and they click up together, and it's a problem in your youth group because then somebody walks in who's a high schooler, and you have a middle school youth group, and they click up, and the high schooler, he don't want to hang out with them kids. And you walk into the youth group, and you've got a lot of athletes, but you've got the one person who's standing on the sideline who's like me and The only athletic thing that I ever did is I played t-ball. I was in the second outfield, and I swatted flies from my face. I hope a ball didn't come my way because it was going to get me because I was more worried about the flies flying around than I was about the pop-up balls that were flying around. They click up. But one thing we haven't noticed, and I've noticed it in elementary school, and I've noticed it being a senior adult pastor, or not a senior adult pastor. Some of y'all are senior. I'm a senior adult pastor to you. A senior pastor is... Clicks exists from preschool all the way to our senior adult ministry. Clicks exist in the church. And praise God, we've got people coming, but I don't want to be part of that. They're not like me. I don't know them. You know, I've talked a lot, y'all, about, it's almost every sermon I talk about people coming down this aisle. And I say, You you probably know what I'm about to say next. People walk down the aisle and they pray to accept Jesus and they get dunked and that's all there is to it. They don't go any further than that. I've said it and people have said, amen. People need to get serious about their faith. But you know, here's one I haven't done before. People get saved. People get dunked. We scream hallelujah, but then it doesn't go further than a right hand of Christian fellowship. It doesn't go further than victory in Jesus. It doesn't go further than a hug around the neck. 
there's people in our congregation, and I'm not picking on y'all because some of y'all have come up to me and you're going to think, oh, is he talking about me? There's people who, who have had people who sit right in front of them, two rows in front of them, two rows behind them, to the side of them. And they'll come up to me three weeks later and they'll say, Brother Taylor, who was that with the hair, with the dress? Oh, she's, she just dresses real pretty. Who was that that sits in front of me? Well, the, the preacher has to know, but you don't have to know? You, you, don't, you don't know who it is? Why, why, why is it not going further than the right hand of Christian fellowship? Why is it not going further than looking around and saying, wow, there sure are a lot of people in here. Why is it not going further than that? The speed bump is we've got to know one another. We, we, we've got to understand one another. We have to disciple one another and teach one another. We have to bond in unity. It's the same thing I preached three years ago. It's just different now. You want to know one another? You, you, you want to you wanna know the people who don't look like you, who don't dress like you, who don't act like you, who might be a different age than you, who might do a different job than you? You want to know those people? Do more than just shake their hand when they join the church. Go up to the visitor. I'm sorry if I scare you visitors, but this is a family church. We love one another. There's unity in this church, but we've got to break through some of the things that are stopping us. Go up to the visitor and say, I'm so glad you visited with us today. I would love for you to join me sometime for, for dinner, for lunch. I don't know about you, but um, some of y'all are tired. You, you got a little bit of time for a lunch date. You've got time for a phone call. You, you, you've got time to reach across the aisle. It's, it's, I've told you, it's not going to be me who brings them to the church house. It's my job once they get here. I'm going to go out in the community. I'm going to go evangelize. I'm going to go visit. I'm going to get these membership cards. Adrian's got them up. And if you know somebody who's, not a, who's a member of our church and ain't here, we're about to get these uh, visitor cards. We're about to make some phone calls. Where are you at? This is your church. Come on. We're an aggressive church, folks. But it's going to be you who makes the connections. It's going to be you who draws them into the church. Because of the people who have come and visited in our congregation, most of these visitors who you're looking at, they're not mine. They're not, Miss Brother, I'm about to call myself Mr. Lindeman. Brother Taylor didn't go out and find them and say, you should come. Our pastor, he's just young and on fire. You just need to come listen to him. That wasn't me. That was Mary Ida at her academy. That was you at your workplace. That was you at Dollar General. That was you at your family reunion. That was you, not me. You're going to have to be the one. And that goes a step further. It's not just go out and invite. It's no. Once they get here, there's people who have been in our congregation who are here this morning who you do not know because they are quote unquote new. You've got to know those people. That's part of this. It's unity across because here's what happens when you don't. Look with me at verses two and three. The Jewish congregation that God has saved at Pentecost has seen there's new life in the church. And this new life doesn't look like what the Old Testament said it would look like, according to their interpretation. It, it, it doesn't look like what they look like. They're very different. And so in verse 2, they go up to Peter. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they were th that were of the circumcision contended with him. That's the Jews. That's the people who said, okay, I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, but there's just one problem. I also believe in the circumcision of Abraham that was delivered to him in the book of Genesis. We need both of these things. They believe that God came only to save the Jew. And so they go up to Peter, and this is so funny to me, because this is the big issue. Like you look in Galatians, this is the issue that Paul is talking about. This is the issue of the, first, of the first century church, is whether or not to let the Gentiles in. That is as silly sometimes as whether or not to let, to change the carpet color, whether or not to do all these silly things that we fuss about. They're fussing about it in the first century as well. And they say this to Peter in verse three, saying, thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. They're arguing about who they're eating with. They're arguing about, what table they're sitting at at fellowship dinner. That's what they're arguing about. They're arguing about going up to people who look different from them, who are not like them, who, well, God might have saved them or, or might be willing to save them, but they got to do some other stuff first. I'm so glad they walk, but they don't have any business walking because they don't look like me. They haven't been in church as long as I have. 
That's our mindset sometimes. And while we stop and we praise God for what he's doing, we also need to recognize that the people that God is sending, they're not necessarily going to fit in straight away. They're not necessarily going to look like us straight away. They're not necessarily going to click with every single individual in the congregation straight away. But here is the difference. God needed to use the Gentiles because the Jewish people of the day were not getting the job done as he needed them done. He needed them to reach the entire known world. So he took people who looked radically different from the Pharisaic Jews, and he saved them in order that he could reach the nations. And the reality is, folks, that God, every person he brings us, he's bringing them for a reason. I remember three years ago when I picked up where Brother Kyle Jones left off and started teaching Experiencing God, we were towards the end of the book, and one of the only lessons that I taught, the lesson was God has a plan of who is going to walk through that door. He knows the needs of this church, and he's going to send people to fill those needs. And I remember very clearly preaching that lesson and saying, Phew, we need an AV person. We need somebody to run the AV around here. We, we, need, we, need, we need that sturdy. And guess who he sent through the back door? Kenneth McArdle. And Kenneth McArdle didn't just fill the need that we needed. He installed the screens and the TV in the back, and he did the whole AV room over again, and he put the TV in here and there and yonder. He did so much more than what we even, God knew. We we're about to grow. But first, I'm going to send the man to pave the way. God has sent every single visitor who's in our midst this morning and who's ever walked through these doors because he has a plan for their use right here, right now. He doesn't send us to warm pews. He sends us to do the job that nobody else can fill in. He fills them, he sends them to to fill in for, for Wednesday night kids, to fill in for Sunday school teachers in the back. They might not look like us, though. They might not have been in this church for 10 years. They might not know the ins and outs of our constitution or the way that we do things. They might not know, but God is sending them here even in that ignorance that we might use them for his glory, that we might bind together in unity across this congregation and know that we need every single person who's here for the task at hand. If we're going to grow, we're going to have more Sunday school classes, we're going to need more Sunday school teachers. If we're, if we're going to grow then we're going to need to know all the names. We're going to need greeters out on the front porch. If we're going to grow, we've got to have all the things in place that is necessary to accomplish the task at hand. God has sent you for a purpose such as this. And church, while they might not look like us, we've got to recognize how valuable of an asset that they are. That God has sent them here for a time such as this. We need them on our side. We need them to be used by God in the same way that he's using you. Oh, it feels good when God uses us. But the reality is the work piles up really quick when we're going out to a lost world around us. We need all on board. And how are we going to do that? We're going to have to go to them and say, I'm so glad you visited. Here are the needs of our church. I I would love for your child to do this, that, and the other. We have to go to them. We have to share with them how things are done, how this church operates. That way we can accomplish the kingdom goal together. God has sent them for a time such as this, and we have to use them. And what happens when we do, when we actually do follow through with all of these things, we're going to have the same type of growth that we preached about three years ago. We're going to have people who are going to further their walk with the Lord in discipleship. We're going to have people make life-changing decisions, and we're going to get the pleasure of seeing them walk this aisle and be dunked in this baptistry. And what's going to happen at the end of all of that is we're going to have to recognize what he's doing. Look with me at verse 18 as we finish up this morning. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, "Then." hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. I remember one of the last times that I saw my grandmother because it was right before COVID. And after COVID, unfortunately, the only time I got to see her is I got to peek through the window at the nursing home because they were on super duper lockdown. But I remember one of the last times we got to bust her out. She wanted to go and she wanted to find 
I, I'm telling you, it had to have been my great, great, great grandfather's burial plot. He, she wanted to go at graveyard hunting. And so I load my grandmother up who can't even walk anymore. And so she can get out of the wheelchair and get into the car. I pile, I, it's the Prius. I'm in a Prius with my grandmother, my wife, and an entire wheelchair. I mean, the wheelchair is on top of my 80-whatever-year-old grandmother. And we're going graveyard hunting. And I should have known, but I didn't, I didn't think about it, that she would have no clue where any of these cemeteries are. Put that in your wristwatch. That's what she called the phone because she had never held a cell phone in her entire life. Put in your wristwatch where such and such cemetery is. Um, I, it's kind of like these Brooklyn cemeteries. You know, you just drive five miles down Pierce Road and then there's going to be a, a spot in the trees where the tree line breaks. Turn left immediately. You know, th that's not on Google. And so here we are just driving through and literally, if you've been to Meridian, you know, we're in the middle of Why Not. Yes, why not Mississippi? Why not go to why not? Because your cell service will go out. That's why not. And so here we are in why not Mississippi driving around looking for the tree line to break. And she says, pull over and ask somebody where the cemetery is. She wants me to pull over and get out and knock on random doors until we find a cemetery that's buried in the woods. They're not going to know. And I might get shot. This is Meridian. And so we're driving around. And finally, I'm up to my wits end. She's getting mad. We can't find the cemetery, so we go to the old folks' place, the checkerboard restaurant. Uh, maybe maybe y'all know the checkerboard restaurant. Maybe not. And we go in, and we're waiting for our table, and she's just a fussing. All I want to do is find the cemetery. Da -da 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 -da. She's just chewing my head off. And I, I leveled with her. I said, Memo, I did not come today to find cemeteries. I, I know that's the purpose. That's the plan. That's the reason that you got out. But the reason I came today is to spend the day with my memo. Because I don't know if I'm going to see you ever again. I don't know when the Lord's going to take you on home. I came today not to see and trek through the woods. And by the way, y'all, um, how is she going to trek through the woods in a wheelchair? How are we, go we going to get way deep in the woods? Uh, anyway, that's not here, there, yonder. I came to see you. That's the express purpose for what I'm doing this for. And finally, she understood. She recognized that the whole purpose of all of this was not to go and see the cemeteries, but to see me. And we had a great lunch after that. Why do I tell you that story? Because some of us need to wake up and recognize. If we're growing this church that so looks more like you and me, we're doing it wrong. If we're, if we're growing this church so that my buddies can get together and we, we, we can have church, but not anybody else, if we're getting together so that we can look out and say, see what I did, we're doing it wrong. But when we recognize that when we look out over this congregation and we look in this parking lot and we see all these cars, when we recognize that it's all about what God is doing, when we recognize that God is bringing people to church who may not have darted the doors in many years, when we recognize that God is saving souls eternally, this is something somebody on the way out last week said. We need to recognize that when these little ones come down, when adults come down and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, that is not just, well, that's just one more we get to dunk. That is a soul saved from hellfire. We've got to recognize that the gospel is being lived out right before our eyes. This is not just a church that's growing, but this is a church that is recognizing that because God has stepped down from heaven, because God has given his life on Calvary for you and for me, because God has saved sinners, we are getting to look out and see the blessing of God over all of our lives. This is what it's all about. We've got to recognize what God's doing. And in our text this morning in Acts 11, verse 18, from verse 4 all the way to verse 17, we see Peter explaining what God has been doing in the Gentiles. That they may not look like you, but God has saved them. He has snatched their soul from hell. And at the end, verse 18, when they heard, who is that? The people of the circumcision, the Jews. When they heard these things, they showed up. They held their peace. They didn't say nothing else. Why? They glorified God instead, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. This morning, if I could tell you one last thing about the people in this room, 
is that there's people in this room who were just like you at one time, who didn't know the Lord, who didn't know him at all, who were actively running from him. God has done, is doing the same thing in their life that he did in yours. That while at one point you were a sinner in need of a, of a pastor's sermon that was directed at you, there's people in here who need that, who are in that part of their spiritual walk. That there's people in this room who once were where you are. That if they hadn't been to church in a very long time, they need to be welcomed in just as you were welcomed into our congregation. And there's people in this church who are on fire and ready to do whatever it takes to reach this church, to reach this community, and to reach the world for God. And they need you to help them, to train them, to disciple them, to equip them, and to send them out to do whatever it is that God has called them here for. As a church, we've got to recognize there's people who are where we used to be. Let's help them get where we are and way further than that. That they might know God, know him intently, and accomplish way more than we've ever seen before. My prayer is not that this church would do well under my leadership or in my generation, but that for generations and generations and generations, this church would grow to be a lighthouse in this community that affects every person in its vicinity. And this morning, my invitation to you is maybe to look out and to say, who is that person who I need to to be united with, to know better? Maybe this morning for a visitor, It's to recognize that this is a church that wants to train you up, that wants to know you, that wants to equip you. And maybe this morning for a person in the room who has strayed from God, maybe this morning your invitation is a rededication or to be a part of this great call to follow a God who sees us all where we are, loves us, and beckons us to follow him. Would you stand with me as we sing this hymn of invitation, Just As I Am? Thank you for joining us online today. Remember, you can find additional videos at these online locations. If you would like to give, you can mail your offering to First Baptist Church Brooklyn at P.O. Box 340 in Brooklyn, Mississippi, 39425. If you would like to talk to someone, you can call our church number or you can visit us for one of our in-person worship times. We hope to see you soon.